Boom. Hey, welcome back to my channel. My name is Nick, and today we are getting into the 1997 horror classic, Scream 2. If you've watched my Scream video for the original, I stated how the new Scream, I'm just gonna call it Scream 5 because I think it's insanely stupid that they named it Scream, but Scream 5 comes out in January of 2022. I've seen all the Scream movies probably. Just, just hundreds, hundreds of times. I absolutely love them and Scream 2 is my personal favorite. So what I thought would be fun, as I said in the first video, is each month leading up to Scream 5, I would do a reaction and a commentary to each of the films. And I'm gonna give you guys a little, you know, trivia, fun facts, behind the scenes stuff, which you may not know. Before we get into that, make sure to like, comment, and hit the notification button so that you can get notifications when I upload a new video. All right, let's get into the movie. Like imagine going to see Scream 5 and they had something like that. I mean, after seeing this movie, I would immediately turn around and run home, but you get my point. Sandra Bullock is playing right down the street. Nobody wanna pay 750 to see some Sandra Bullock shit. That she naked. Look, she's about to read the Caucasians right now. It's a dumbass white movie about some dumbass white girls <laughs> getting their white asses cut the fuck up, okay? <laughs> genre is historical for excluding the african-american element so that is true if you've seen the original scream it's all white it's all white i think the only black people in that entire movie are like in the background like extras now this one diverse which i love Every single time I watch this movie with somebody, they're always freaking out like, what is going on in this movie theater? Like, I've never been to a movie theater where, where people are like this hyped and going nuts. Well, apparently you didn't go to theaters to see Avengers Endgame. Now, there has been this long standing uh, misconception that because it said directed by Robert Rodriguez, like the stab film, that it was actually directed by Robert Rodriguez. It was not. Robert Rodriguez was originally up to direct the original Scream and then turned it down and gave it back to Wes Craven. So when Wes Craven did Scream 2, he added his name in the beginning of the credits for Stab as like a thank you, like a hats off to him sort of thing. Damn. Valid. One thing I always thought was weird when I was watching the scene, like of Stab, Ghostface mentions the boyfriend in the backyard, but throughout the entire scene, you never actually see the boyfriend, which makes me wonder like, did Steve even exist in the opening scene of Stab? Um, can I have a medium popcorn, no butter, and a small Diet Pepsi? You got it. Who the f orders popcorn without any butter? Baby, it's just a movie. Uh, scary movies are great foreplay. Are scary movies great foreplay? Maybe for like people who don't like scary movies? Cause like for me, scenario. Chris Evans comes over and Chris Evans says, let's watch a scary movie. 10 minutes in, he's trying to ruffle my feathers. No, I'm trying to watch a movie. I don't have time for that. After, after. Now these heifers standing up in front of the screen, that would not fly with me, no. This one out of all of them. When I saw this in theaters when I was a kid, this movie scared the shit out of me. Hello? Okay, so the person whispering is Mickey. Mickey is the one who does all the kills. <laughs> and if you like turn the subtitles on and you listen, he's like, he's saying, listen, mommy. Now the reason why I say like, to, I'm pointing out the whole listen mommy thing is because it is an early clue that there's a mother killer, Billy's mom. Ugh, not only did you have to die, but now you gotta lay on that dirty ass bathroom floor. Ugh.
Oh, I still think the original opening scene is the best one. I would say that this is a worthy follow-up. Like, this scene is so well-written. It is so scary. The fact that nobody thinks that her getting stabbed is real. Also, the disgusting sounds and noises she makes as he's stabbing her. Oh. The thing about, like, this death scene, or majority of the deaths in Scream 1 and 2, they're not goofy. Like, she's not cracking quips as she's dying. She's not saying, but wait, I'm gay, or f*** Bruce Willis. Worst line in the entire franchise. When you have a horror movie, like Scream 1 and 2, and this is where Scream 3 and 4 went wrong, you don't have humor mixed in during the death scenes. You could have humor elsewhere, not during the death scenes, because you undermine the seriousness of what is happening. Three cheers for Sydney Prescott, bad bitch. What's your favorite scary movie? Who is this? You tell me. Corey Gillis, 5550176. I love this movie. Most people are cool. Uh, there's uh, some who still keep a safe distance, which is odd for me because I've always been sort of a people person. But you were wrongly accused. You were fully exonerated. Fun little fact, the uh, the person that he's talking to, Cotton, is Kevin Williamson, who wrote Scream 1 and 2, and a fairly large portion of Scream 4. And he will be executive producing Scream 5, so he gave it a stamp of approval. That is so moral majority. You can't blame real life violence on entertainment. What? what? Wait a second, yes you can. Don't... Sarah Michelle mother Keller. That is my queen. That is Buffy Summers. That is Cece Cooper. That is Helen Shivers. <sighs> it's bullshit generalization. Many sequels have surpassed their original. Oh, yeah? Name one. Scream 2. <laughs> Aliens is a classic, okay? Get away from her, you bitch. I believe the line is stay away from her, you bitch. It's film class, right? <laughs> so, Randy is actually wrong. Joshua Jackson's character did get the, the quote correct. It was just a screwy thing that happened during filming. I got it, by the way. I got it. The Godfather, part two. Yeah. See, some other like little hints that it's Mickey, um, aside from Joshua Jackson, who isn't a character in this movie outside of this scene, but Mickey is the only one that is hard pressed to prove that sequels surpass the original. He picks The Godfather, which is a movie that is largely centered on family. Mrs. Loomis. And I don't wanna go back there again. Can we just go back to our pseudo quasi happy existence? Hello, Derek. How you doing? Hey, yeah. I've been looking everywhere. Everybody shits on Derek. Everybody shits on Derek. I love Derek. I thought that Derek was a really good partner for Sydney. He was caring. He sings to her. And also he didn't try to stab her. I mean, isn't that everything you want in a man? Are you kidding me? It'd be stupid to pull this movie. All this free press, they're gonna have huge numbers this weekend. Look how sickening she looks, though. Like, that hair is everything. Her outfit is everything. I'm Debbie Salt. Uh, I took your seminar in Chicago last year. I was the one in the front row asking all the questions. Yeah, I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> oh. So there was another, that's that's uh, another clue that Mrs. Her, Debbie Salt, Mrs. Loomis, is one of the killers. She plays Gail by figuring that there's a potential that she might recognize her. So she makes up the story about being at her seminar. But Gail says, I thought you looked familiar. Hello, girls. Enjoying yourselves? Oh, hello, Sister Lois. Sister Murphy. Hello, Pledge. Hi, Sydney. Hey, this must be flat out hell for you. And of course, Rebecca Gayhart. We love psycho Rebecca Gayhart. Go watch Urban Legend if you haven't. Dewey? Dewey. Seeing someone. Nice guy, pre-med, no apparent psychotic tendencies. <gasps> That's literally my checklist for a man. If there is some freaked out psycho trying to follow in Billy Loomis's footsteps, you probably already know him. Or her. Or them. They're probably already in your life. Now, that is not a clue from the actual killers, but it is a clue to the audience that just because it was two guys in the first one doesn't mean that it can't be a girl. Chief Hartley said the girl was stabbed seven. Drop it. Hello, Sydney. How are you? Hi. What do you want, Gail? She's here to be a bitch. 
Oh no, right then and there I would have clocked her ass. What the hell are you doing? We want to know how you feel. Tell us everything that's happened looking back on the last two years. There is another piece of, there's another misconception out there amongst the Scream fans, the Scream community. Scream 2 takes place in 1998. It does not take place in 1997. When Gail says, looking back on everything that has happened over the last two years, she's not talking about the Woodsboro murders and her mother. Maureen was murdered in 1995. The Woodsboro murders happened in 1996. Two years later, this happens. Do you have any comments? You bitch. Hey, 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 hey. Deep so, camera, oh, Sydney, share with us, please. Oh, oh, I'll share with you. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Did you get that on film? Yes, I got that on film. Sydney's a bad bitch. Ooh. Deputy Dewey filled the room with his Barney Fifish presence. Read my book. Oh, yes, I do read Miss Weathers. Look, character wise, I know he like loves Gail and blah 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 blah. But if she would have written about me like that, I mean, I love Gail, but I would have offered her ass up on a platter to those killers. Omega Beta Zeta. Hello. Yes. Who is this? CC. Who's this? You better believe that for like a solid two to three years after this movie came out. I every phone call I answered, Omega Beta Zeta. Also fun fact, the person that was on the other end of the phone with her, her friend, is voiced by Selma Blair, who in real life is best friends with Sarah Michelle Gellar. Hello? Hello? Stop it! See, my friends would do shit like this to me. I don't think I'm alone. I'm out of here. But see now here, she displays smart logic. Instead of staying, she goes to get out of the house. I'm calling from the Omega Beta Zeta house. Like someone's harassing me. Hello? Shit! Hey! Oh, Jesus, Donna, you scared me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Did, did anyone call for me? I always have to point this out. Her sorority sister's name is Donnie. In Buffy, her sister's name is Donnie. Omega Beta Zeta. So I've always loved that shot because it clues the audience in that there's two killers because one was clearly on the phone and one came in. But I also like that instead of just randomly having him pop out and not knowing whether or not he's actually there or not, you see him. So you know she's f he's in the house. That's right, throw everything you got at him. I was so engrossed in Buffy, I was like, how, how is she not just kicking the shit out of him? She's the Slayer! Now 100%, full honesty, when that happened in the theater, I cried. Tears coming, streaming down my face. Sarah Michelle Gellar needs to stay away from like heights because she is always falling, jumping, getting tossed off of shit and everything. Gail, hi, you're just getting here. It's not good. It's a single victim sorority girl. So I gotta go, I've got a deadline. So this is another clue. She, Mrs. Loomis, she is always the first one at the scenes of the crime. So she's always beating Gail. But also she says, I gotta go, I got a deadline. It's because she's literally yeeting herself across the street right now so that she and Mickey can attack Sydney. I love that look on her face because you know she knows that it's him. She knows that it's the killer. I mean, like, how strong would one have to be to actually be able to get that knife through that door like that? He just needs to realize the 90s is no time to play hero. Why would anyone go back in that house anyway? So I've always loved that part because that is Mickey sort of doing what Stu did in the first one where he begins casting suspicion on everybody else as to not get found out. 
yet. Because we all know that Mickey wants to get found out. Do you think someone's trying to duplicate Woodsboro? It looks like it. I think you have a copycat on your hands, Chief. So this is a flaw for this movie. I'm not gonna say that this movie is flawless because it's not, but that entire copycat uh, scenario thing is completely dropped after that scene. Now I'm sure that there's plenty of people and probably myself that can figure out a way to make it make sense. But realistically, I think it was just a subplot that was ultimately dropped for whatever reason. Most likely to the fact that the script leaked on the internet very early into filming. So they had to do rewrites. Well, it just seems to me that if the killer is repeating, what happened in Woodsboro, it's quite possible that the killer could be from Woodsboro. That's all. Yet another clue that she is the killer. She's saying that the person is literally from Woodsboro, meaning her. <laughs> they checked out Randy. What? I know he's an innocent victim first time around, but he's a little off, you know what I'm saying? Come on, Randy, the guy's harmless. That's what they said about Dahmer. Another example of Mickey trying to cast suspicion on other people. And so I just decided to myself, I'd hide it to myself. And what is he doing? Uh, Tom Cruise, Top Gun, 1986. People shit on this scene constantly, calling it cringy. And sure, it is cringy, but it's so cute. He loves her so much. I don't care what any of the naysayers say. I love this scene. <laughs> That was so cute. That was so cute. It's good luck. It'll protect you. <laughs> I love love. So tell us about this part you're getting rave reviews for. Well, I play this young girl, Sydney Prescott, who discovers that her boyfriend's this crazy serial killer. Thankfully, she was a good sport about it, but they literally made fun of her in the first one when Dewey's... Uh, when Tatum asks her, who do you think will play you if they ever make a movie? And she's like, oh, like, God forbid they'll cast Tori Spelling. And apparently Tori Spelling was a good sport about it and chose to have a cameo. Hallie, Sid's roommate? Serial killers are typically white males. That's why it's perfect. It's sort of against the rules, but not really. Mrs. Voorhees was a terrific serial killer. So I know everybody loves Randy and I love Randy too, but I mean, did his rules ever really help? Also, he, uh, well, I mean, it came to nothing, but he was correct. Like that entire dialogue about a female serial killer, yet again, trying to hammer in to the audience, there's a strong possibility that there is a female killer. And you've got your love scar to prove it. And so do you. I mean, what's with that limp anyway? Because you were stabbed on the back. Severed nerve. So I, I pointed this out in my uh, reaction to the first film. Um, but one of the things that I've always really loved is the clothing that they make characters wear. So just like in the first one, Randy is wearing green. Dewey is wearing beige. And unlike Sydney in the first one, who was predominantly dressed in like grays and blues, she's now wearing black. Why? Because she's been through some shit. No crime against gods or men. I absolutely adore this scene. This is quite possibly one of my favorite scenes in the entire franchise. Um, and again, this scene gets shit on a lot and I don't know why. Thematically, it is so powerful. It's shot so well and I feel like it adds such depth to the movie and it, it like it gives a, a maturity to the movie. Like, can you imagine, I'm sorry to say it, but Aaron Kruger trying to write this? Aaron Kruger is the one who wrote Scream 3 and then did rewrites for Scream 4, all the comedy. And everyone thinks that this is a hallucination, but it's not a hallucination. Like you literally hear the person running away. And then Derek immediately tells her that he had to switch with Mickey because he had to edit. She, she questions why it's Derek is there and not Mickey. Mickey did all that just to fuck with her. Anyway, you're forgetting something. In Woodsboro, there were more victims before the home stretch. Tatum, my cameraman, him. Everyone complains that Tatum does not 
get mentioned again. She was literally just mentioned right then and there, and Dewey even has a pained expression. No, there is not bigger conversations about Tatum, and I do agree that there should be, but to pretend like Tatum has never been mentioned, she's mentioned here, she's, she uh, is alluded to in Scream 3. Actually, she's also referred to by the killer as well. Jail's not here. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? You three look deep in thought. Have you ever felt a knife cut through human flesh and scrape the bone beneath? So I always like to point out to whoever I show this movie to, like, the killer was intending to kill Gail here. She's calling Gail's phone, and Randy just ended up being the one who answered. And the only reason that Randy died here was because he started talking shit about Billy. Showgirls, absolutely frightening. What's yours? Many people disagree. This is a huge complaint with the fan base. Everybody is so pissed off that they killed Randy, calling it the wrong choice. I highly disagree. While I do like Randy, like that's the whole point of the first two films. That's what makes the first two films good, in my opinion, is the fact that everybody can die, even your most beloved characters. It brings realism, it brings uh, it brings gravity to the situation. So as much as I like Randy, I fully support the decision to kill him off. Let me just tell you this much, when I saw this in theaters, I was shook. What amazes me is that people were like, uh, there was like a rumor or something about Randy potentially being brought back, that he was going to be whisked away by his family so that he could recover. I'm like, his throat was slashed. What? Cotton. Can we talk for a sec? Um, th this isn't a good time. Come on, Sid, you sent me to prison. I did over a year for you. You can give me two minutes. Now, Cotton, Cotton is a character that I will agree with the fan base that he's a very, very interesting, well written, uh, not teenagery character who should not have been killed off in the opening scene of the third one. I don't mind him being killed off but not in the opening scene. We'll see what they do with Scream 5, but I think, you know, while Scream 1 and 2 focus on high schoolers and then college students, I do like that Scream 3 focused on adults. I don't necessarily think it constantly has to revolve around teenagers, which is why I like Cotton, because Cotton, like, he had an entire backstory. He was such an interesting character, and it's such a shame that he died, even though he is an asshole. <laughs> I mean, come on, Cindy, you dragged my name through the mud. Everybody thinks I'm some kind of psycho killer, and all I'm asking for is one little fucking Diane Sawyer interview. Ooh, he's got the killer's shoes on. That was, I love that they do that in the films. I don't think they did it in the fourth film, but in the first two films and the third film, they always have the characters, majority of them wearing the exact same shoes that the killer wears. That shouldn't have been Randy. That shouldn't have been me. Yeah. You call his mother. See, I already made that phone call. This scene wasn't originally in the script, I don't believe. I believe it was added in towards middle to end of filming because they wanted a scene. It, they never had a scene where Sydney actually reacted to Randy's death. So they added that in, which is 100% necessary. Don't do anything stupid, Cotton. Gail, you were so instrumental in my freedom. You're not having character doubts now, are you? Ooh, you see the way he played that? He was such a good character. They're gonna take you somewhere safe, Sid. Yeah, where's that? I don't know, but I'll be there with you. This is the point that they should have added in another scene with Mickey, because a complaint, which I do understand, is after that lunchroom scene, you don't see Mickey again until the reveal. So I, I do think, I know there was another deleted scene with him, maybe more than one, but I do wish that they would have added at least one scene right in around this point so that audiences remember that he exists still look local woman i know that you hold me up as your career template and it gives you some sort of charge to challenge me but give it a rest look at her she's like i'm gonna stab the shit out of you later what's going on Ooh, let's see for starters uh they impounded my van it's now an official crime scene thanks to you here's your footage enjoy see you wouldn't want to be you Joel is all of us. 
If the killer really is watching and relishing every minute, then he'd be here on these tapes, right? In each crime scene. It's worth a look. Now see, if they had actually gotten the opportunity to review those tapes, I feel like they would have immediately been like, yep, Mickey and Debbie Salt. I don't know why they, they like randomly chose to go and break into the, the sound studio. Like I would have just went right back into the police station and been like, where are your VCRs? I'm sorry. Like, I never meant to hurt you. Hey. Really? Now what we are about to get is one of two of the most suspenseful, scariest chase scenes that, in my opinion, in slasher movies. Definitely top two of the entire franchise, for sure. I was terrified in theaters. F***ing terrified. I really thought that Gail was gonna die. So this is Mrs. Loomis who attacks them both, but I don't know how she got out of that room because there doesn't appear to be another door. There's no one there. Also, I'm fairly certain that just like the first one, that's actually Laurie Metcalf's voice that was dubbed in when she gets hit with the phone. I would have shit my pants. I would have shit my pants. Oh, the scene is so good. The scene is so good. And like, he knows that she's there because he's like, she's messing with her now. I love this part. It is so sad, but it's so good. Ugh, tears. I had tears when I saw that. My only grievance with that scene, my only grievance is when Gail finally turns around and sees what's happening and starts screaming, you can see the reflection of Ghostface directly in front of her as if he's just standing directly on the other side of the glass just looking at her. And I just wish like on like a future remaster or Blu-ray that they fix that and remove that. But that whole thing with Dewey dying, it was so beautifully shot. I love how it com like it was just the score that is playing. It was so powerful and I am still to this day annoyed that they kept Dewey alive. I love Dewey in the first two movies, but after the first two movies, he's useless. When this is all over, I'll still be here. Oh, see, he's sweet. He loved her. Also, there was a script, the leaked original script that has been online since for like 15 years or something at this point. Kevin Williamson himself confirmed recently that that script is fake. So Hallie and Derek were never the killers. Here we go. Scene number two of the scariest shit that I've seen in a slasher film. Car, you fucker. <laughs> I love that. Oh. No, he's fine. He'll just walk it off. He has a pole through his f***ing head. Oh my god. Don't do that again. And Hallie. <laughs> I would have liked like another scene or two with Hallie just to flesh her out a little bit more, but honestly, I feel like Hallie deserves just as much respect as Tatum does. So I think 
myself and everybody else in the theater thought, okay, Sydney got out, but if Hallie has to go through, there's no way that she's not dying. He's going to wake up and he's going to stab her as she's trying to climb across him. Cl climb across him. Words. I want to know who it is. So that would have been, that little moment would have been when Mickey was able to get out of the car and go over the hood to go around to get Hallie. I wish that they would have ran for a little bit longer, just like an additional beat or two so that their backs were turned, but. He's gone. What? <laughs> R.I.P. Hallie. I found Dewey. So that's another thing I didn't understand. That's one of really my, my main big one that I don't get is why was Cotton even in there in the first place? It's a matter. Operator, this is an emergency. Give me the police. What's happening? The killer is Cotton fucking Weary. Cotton Weary. Again, Mrs. Loomis, who just attacked them, is directly outside. First one there. I mean, come on. If it wasn't obvious, well, I was shocked when she was revealed too, so I can't say it should have been more obvious. But upon rewatching, it's very obvious. I also love thematically how the film opens in a movie theater and closes on a theater stage. Oh, Kevin Williamson, man. Also, can we talk about the fact, like, okay, I get, I mean, sororities and fraternities, I mean, we know that they're all f full of shit and that the things that they do to people are horrible, but, like, they just left him up there. Don't you know history repeats itself? Mm. Sid. So upon first watch, we been knew. We knew that it was Mickey. But first watch, we did not know that it was gonna be Debbie Salt. So I liked that like we had one killer, which we could sort of actually genuinely be able to figure out as the movie went on. But then the second one, that was the shocker. Like in the first one. No, Billy was a sick fuck who tried to get away with it. Mickey is a sick fuck who wants to get caught. Yeah. yeah. See, I've got my whole defense planned out. I'm gonna blame the movies. See, I like his motive. I think it's an incredibly sick and twisted motive. Yeah. Well, you're forgetting one thing about Billy Loomis. What's that? I fucking killed him. <laughs> oh, bad bitch energy right there. Yes, Sydney. Can't be. I've, I've, I've seen pictures of you. This is 60 pounds and a lot of work later. Even in the face of death, Sydney is just dragging bitches left and right. We met on the internet, psycho website, classifieds. There's only an estimated 97 active serial killers in the country today, so Mickey here was quite fine. I think it's also pretty creepy to think about the fact that Mickey, at least based on that, Mickey was a killer before this. I'm very sane. My motive isn't as 90s as Mickey's. Mine is just good old-fashioned revenge. You killed my son. Lori Metcalf sells the shit out of this performance. And those eyes of hers? You're as crazy as your son was. What did you just say? Was that a negative, disparaging remark about my son? Sydney, <laughs> you are playing with fire, girl. Look at, look at her pupils. The way she is screaming, she is crazy. Don't you fucking move. God damn it! God. I mean, I low-key think like Sydney might have died had Cotton not showed up. Which is also reminiscent of the original's ending, because Sydney would have died from Billy had Gail not shown up with a gun at the last minute. So look. I love me some Sydney Prescott. She's a bad bitch. But her survival frequently, because she's she's saved sort of by Dewey in the third one too. And in the fourth one. I mean, she would have died. She sent you to prison for a year. Personally, I think it's rather poetic. 
And this is kind of showing how dark Cotton's character is. I mean, aside from being a sleaze ball, like if she didn't agree to this interview, he potentially would have killed her. Prestige. Could somebody get me out of here? I'm fully in support of Gail surviving this one. I don't know. I always come back. They lit his ass up and he went flying. <laughs> Just in case. And that's how you do it. That's how you double tap. That's how you make sure that the killer is dead. Even if it seems like he's dead, even if they're not moving, doesn't matter how many times you stabbed him, double tap. Even being a kid in the theater, I was rolling my eyes. Like, just with the amount that this man gets stabbed, hit, falls down stairs, falls down hills, trips over his own feet, gets hit with bedpans, tied up. I mean, I'm team kill Dewey in Scream 5. Talk to Cotton. He's the man you want to interview. He's the hero. Sydney, you are solely responsible at this point for allowing Cotton to have a television show called 100% Cotton. So originally in this scene, and you can see, uh, you can find the image of it. When the camera pulls back and you see like the clock tower thing, originally you see a shot of somebody in the ghost face costume watching Sydney walk away. Um, but they ultimately cut it from the film. I'll try to throw it up on the screen at the end or something. So that was Scream 2. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that, as you should, because it's a fantastic movie. It is my favorite one out of the entire franchise. I love the original, but for me personally, Scream 2 just marginally beats the first one. I love the story, I love the killers. It was, for me, significantly scarier than the first one, and I love me some tension-filled chase scenes and Scream 2 delivered. Oh, the image that I was talking about, I'll try to throw that up right here, of the ghost face in the tower at the end. Unfortunately, they cut it. Let me know what you guys thought about the movie down in the comments. Next month in November, I will have Scream 3, which I know is just everybody's favorite. And then in December, I will have Scream 4, which is some people's favorites for whatever reason. See you guys next time.